Well, thank you very much. You know, this is interesting because I'm really do doing more history, and I know this is not necessarily science, but one of the weird things in my life was that I actually studied with a man who was an expert on Hanukkah. He was an expert on First and Second Maccabees, and I'll show you uh, a little bit of that. His name was Jonathan Goldstein. He was a Jewish rabbi and recognized uh, as uh, probably the greatest living expert on First and Second Maccabees and on Hanukkah. And some of the things he taught, I actually took courses from him and uh, picked up a number of things. He did teach me well in a lot of areas. He was a brilliant uh, researcher. He was a brilliant linguist. But as far as I was concerned, as far as his historical analysis was concerned, it left a great deal to be desired. And I'll show you why I say that. So I'm going to pick on my advisor tonight. Uh, he's now dead. I would never have done this while I was doing uh, graduate work underneath of him because I would never have gotten that PhD that you see up there. But uh, I do want to take and deal with that and show you a little bit of what's taking place. And in it, we're going to have to deal, as you'll see, with the book of Daniel. By the way, I'll tell you a very quick story. I've got a granddaughter who's into tennis, and we were over to this, uh, she's taking a tennis uh, lesson, and we're over to this tennis uh, courts, and there was a lady there who was Jewish, and we got to talking, and her son was taking some lessons, and I don't know how we got off on Hanukkah, and I said to her, I said, you realize that I am an expert on Hanukkah? And she looked at me like, you know, you are a crazy Gentile. And uh, I explained to her, you know, where my education came from, and it was very interesting to me to find out she really didn't know that much about Hanukkah herself even though that, of course, is a Jewish holiday. But let's jump into this, and if I lose you, give me a kind of a blank stare, and I'll try to back up and try to explain it, where I'm going with it, okay? So let's talk about, first of all, the abomination of desolation of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, and I'll show you where this guy comes from here in a minute. But let's talk about what we mean by the abomination of desolation. This guy is going to take over the Jewish temple. This is in the 160s BC. This is all background for the period of Christ. Uh, it's out of this whole system that Herod the Great will come, by the way, uh, from uh, what we're talking about here. This is all background for the New Testament. And it actually will help give you a real understanding of some of the things in the New Testament. So let's look here at Antiochus IV. Theos Epiphanes, and that translates as God manifest. As I will show you, he will claim to be a God. And that's one of the things that's going to lead to the corruption of the Jewish temple. And uh, you can see some of the things here. Some of the things he'll introduce is sacred prostitution in the temple. In ancient Greek religion and in Roman religion, it was very common to have temple prostitution. For example, at Corinth, and this is a little bit of a background for events in the Corinthian church. At Corinth, there was a temple dedicated to Aphrodite. Her uh, Roman name was Venus. And we're told by one ancient source, not a Christian source, that there were a thousand prostitutes who worked in her temple. So one of the things that Antiochus Epiphanes will do, he's going to introduce temple prostitution into the temple, into Jerusalem. He's also going to sacrifice pigs on the temple altar. And you, of course, know that um, pork is a no-no for Jews. It's not kosher, to say the very least. And he's doing that uh, as a way of, uh, well, it's a part of his religion, but it's also as an insult to the Jews. He will take and crucify, I have killed there, but he actually what he did was he crucified women who had their baby boys circumcised. Then he took the baby boys and he would kill them and hang them from the neck, necks of their dying mothers. So he's extremely cruel. He will also kill anyone who has any kind of a copy of the Old Testament. He's going to begin a very severe persecution of the uh, Jewish religion. He tries to eliminate it is what he's up to. He's trying to get rid of it completely. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, there are times in Jewish history, you know, the great Babylonian captivity. Not a lot of Jews died then. They were all carried away of slaves. But this is the first great persecution of the Jews in history. And then right after that, of course, not too much after that, uh, a couple of centuries later, you're going to have the uh, conquest of the temple in Jerusalem by Titus. And of course, he leaves Jerusalem uh, in ruins. And by the way, all of this stuff is being uh, discovered by archaeology. Not one stone is on top of another, just as Jesus said. Uh, they're finding the stones off the top of the Temple Mount. So it's interesting to see uh, some of the things that uh, fit very well in with the New Testament. 
Now, let me talk to you a little bit about where this guy comes from. When Alexander the Great took out the Persian Empire, he's eventually going to get back to the city of Babylon. He was not going back to Greece. He's going to live in the big city in Babylon, and he's in actually a palace of Nebuchadnezzar. And there he will die at the age of 33 in the year 323 BC. Now, the problem is he uh, has a pregnant Persian wife. She's not even Greek. She's Persian, Persian princess. That child will be born after Alexander had died. So there's really no one that can rule. He doesn't have a son. He does have a brother who has, uh, uh, is mentally incapable. He has a mother who probably could have, but these are Greeks and women don't get to rule with the Greeks. They're the original male chauvinists. And then he, uh, as I said, Alexander had a brother who uh, could not rule. The net result of that was that eventually uh, one of the sons of one of his generals will take and eventually end up killing off all of Alexander's family except for his sister. One sister survives. Now all of that to tell you what's going to happen is Alexander's empire is going to be split into four parts. That, by the way, you can see in the book of Daniel. Daniel prophesies that's going to happen. And here you see the four families that are going to divide up Alexander's empire. The Antigonids take over Greece. The Athletes are going to take over Asia Minor. By the way, their kingdom, when it's taken over by the Romans, is going to become the province of Asia. The Athletes Adelaide Kingdom becomes the province of Asia, where John wrote to the seven churches of Asia. All of those are a part of the old kingdom of the Adelites. And then you have the Ptolemies in Egypt. You all know Cleopatra, Cleopatra VII, who had the affair with Mark Anthony, and also with Julius Caesar. And uh, she was a Ptolemy. By the way, she was a full-blooded Greek, very full-blooded, because they tended to marry brothers and sisters. Uh, they followed that old uh, policy in Egypt that the pharaohs would follow. Uh, that was to marry sisters or, or sisters and half brothers, full sisters and half sisters. Very common. The old joke about Egyptian chronology, or I should say the Egyptian family tree, was that there are no branches on it. Uh, and they, uh, even though they were Greeks, they followed that tradition that the, the ancient pharaoh, Egyptian pharaohs had uh, followed. So she was a full-blooded Greek. And then the final family is one that you probably have never heard of, and that's the Seleucids. Now, the Seleucids started ruling in the city of Babylon, will move the capital a couple of times, and eventually they wanted to be, even though they control Syrian Babylonia, they are Greeks, they want to be on the Mediterranean Sea. So one of the things they're going to do is to found a brand new capital that you all know. And in this particular family, if your name is not Seleucus, and that's where this comes from, this general was named Seleucus, a general of Alexander the Great, your name would be Antiochus. And so they're going to found a city and they named it after an early ancestor in the family whose name was Antiochus, from which we get the city of Antioch. Antioch. So this is where the word Antioch comes from. It's from this particular family. And it's going to end up being a very weird empire because you have Antioch, this clear over on the far western uh, uh, side of that kingdom, and their kingdom goes clear across even into parts of Iran. Now, the problem that's going to develop is that the Ptolemies and the Seleucids both want to control the area of Israel and Lebanon. Lebanon because they have wood. These are Greeks. They've got to have ships. There's no good wood in Egypt for building ships. You can't build ships out of palm trees. doesn't work. But cedar of Lebanon and some of the oak trees and so forth and uh, that's one of the reasons why the Canaanite Phoenicians, same people, by the way, don't uh, be fooled in thinking they're different. They're the very same people, Canaanites and Phoenicians, made a lot of money shipping wood down to Egypt because uh, the Egyptians needed it for their coffins and also for houses and also for building ships. Well, the Greeks need that wood for building ships. So both of them want to control the area there of Lebanon and Israel for that wood. The other reason is there are some very uh, wealthy or money producing uh, uh, roads that go through their trade routes that go through Israel down into, you know, like uh, the Queen of Sheba, clear down into the southern part of Saudi Arabia. And you can make a lot of money uh, working as a, a camel trucker because that's what they were. They were like modern day truckers, only they used camels instead of Mack trucks, uh, hauling stuff up, hauling goods up from uh, Saudi Arabia and even going clear across over, uh, they actually had some connections over with India. So there's trade that's going through Israel. All of that to tell you that the Ptolemies and the Seleucids both wanted to control Israel and uh, uh, Lebanon. 
and they're going to fight a whole series of wars, and we can't really deal with those in any depth here, but I want you to know what's going on. For the first hundred years, roughly from 300 to 200, the Jews were under the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemies treated them fairly well. It's during that period of time, for example, that the Septuagint, how many heard of the Septuagint? Okay, it's during that period of time that the Septuagint will be translated, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But in the year 200, uh, there's problems in Egypt. In the year 200, along comes a king of the Seleucids by the name of Antiochus III. He called himself the Great. He intended to put together Alexander the Great's empire again. So he's calling himself the Great. And he will defeat Ptolemy V. How many heard of Ptolemy V? How many of you heard of the Rosetta Stone? He's the guy that made the Rosetta Stone. And uh, he defeated Ptolemy V, who was a young man at the time. And he's going to take over. Antiochus III took over Lebanon and Israel and so forth, and actually attacked down into Egypt. He's going to make Ptolemy V, by the way, marry his daughter. He figured that was a good way of controlling Ptolemy V. And her name, by the way, was Cleopatra. Uh, she was uh, maybe the second or third Cleopatra. I can't remember which one right now. But her name was Cleopatra. Interesting thing was uh, that she liked her husband better than her dad, so she actually stood up for her husband when, it came, when push came to shove. But anyway, one of the things that will happen then eventually is that uh, Antiochus III gets a little bit too ambitious. He actually did a little campaigning clear over into Greece. He attacked the Antigonids. He attacked the Attalids. The Attalids will join with the Romans, and there's going to be a terrific battle that's fought, and it's called the Battle of Magnesia. And I'll cover this a little bit for you a little bit later on. But the net result is he's going to be defeated. And um, uh, that's going to lead to Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes being sent to Rome as a hostage. He was the second oldest son. His brother eventually is going to become the king, but we'll pick that up. But these are the, the Seleucids, and we're going to be dealing with Antiochus the fourth, Theos Epiphanes, God manifest, and his treatment of the Jews during this period of time in the 160s BC. Okay? Now, as I told you, I studied with Jonathan Goldstein, who was an expert on the Maccabean period. And he used to say that there were four primary sources that you could use for studying Hanukkah and these events. First Maccabees, second Maccabees, the works of Josephus, who was a contemporary of the later apostles. Uh, he was uh, an eyewitness to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, so he's very good in a lot of these things. And the final thing that Jonathan Goldstein said was the book of Daniel. He thought the book of Daniel had been written in 165 BC, not in the 6th century, which is what the Bible, uh, Daniel, indicates, but he thought it had been written in uh, 165 BC. Now I'll give you a quick rundown on what he thought. So Daniel for him is a very key uh, book because he looked on it as an eyewitness he thought there were a lot of problems with it. The problems were really with his interpretation of it. But he looked on the book of Daniel as an actual source that dated right to this very period of time. And parts of it, prophetically, Daniel does indeed do. Now these are his, I'll show you uh, his two main books. This is 1 Maccabees. This is about 600 pages, translation and commentary. And this is 2 Maccabees. And you can see here, again, nearly 600 pages, uh, translation and commentary. He was a good translator. He was a good researcher. But as I told you, I think his historical analysis left a lot to be desired. Now, let me show you what he taught and what basically critical scholars have taught uh, down through uh, these last couple of centuries dealing with the book of Daniel. He said the seer Daniel, he's called him the seer Daniel, um, uh, died in 165 B.C. That was his argument. Daniel 1 through 6 was, is in Aramaic, and he's absolutely right there. And he saw, thought that has, was something that Daniel had collected from Mesopotamia, from other writers, modified it, but basically he wasn't really that interested in it anyway. He was interested in Daniel chapter 7 uh, through for, uh, chapter 12. Now in Daniel chapter 7, from Daniel chapter 7, 1 through 1135, he said was history that was written as prophecy by the seer Daniel. Now what he's arguing, and I know you've probably never studied it before, but the first 35 verses of Daniel chapter 11 are absolutely perfect historical fact. And it's dealing with the wars between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And I could take you through all of those things. It's very interesting to see. 
The king of the south there is Egypt. If you look at those verses, the king of the north is Syria. It's the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Uh, and uh, really, no one who has studied it, even conservatives or, or um, modernist liberal critics, uh, would tell you anything different. Goldstein would tell you it's perfect history, but what he would tell you is it was written down by Daniel in 165 BC after it all had happened. Okay, you with me? And it's, uh, Daniel is a phony. He's a, a deceiver is what, he's, what they're arguing. Now, uh, now, he thought that Daniel 11, 36 to 45, he saw that as Daniel starting now trying to write prophecy. You know? And it, it's all wrong. It doesn't really match doesn't match Antiochus Epiphanes at all. It just doesn't match. And his argument was the reason it doesn't match, he's trying to predict what Antiochus Epiphanes is going to do, and it just doesn't match at all. And he re realized that and recognized that. The fact of the matter is, however, in Christian tradition, and I could chase, take you back in Christian tradition, and also in Jewish tradition, the oldest interpretation we have of this passage of Scripture comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in the War Scroll. And in the War Scroll, this is applied to the King of the Katim. You say, who in the world is that? That is their version of the Antichrist. In Hippolytus, Hippolytus was a disciple of Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. So writing only about 100 years after John wrote the book of Revelation, Hippolytus says this applies to, this applies to the Antichrist. Okay? Now the problem for Goldstein was he thought that all of this, as I said, was a prophecy that was made up by Daniel in 165 BC, then he died, and then of course none of it was fulfilled. It was all a false prophecy. But as I told you, the oldest Jewish source we have says it's future in dealing with the Antichrist. The oldest Christian source we have says it's future in dealing with the Antichrist. Okay, are you with me? Okay. Now, Daniel 12, he, uh, Goldstein used to argue he did not believe in resurrection. He thought that was nonsense, uh, even though he was Jewish and a Jewish rabbi. Uh, he did not believe in resurrection, but he did think that Daniel had predicted a resurrection after Judas the Maccabee came, came on the scene, and we'll talk about Judas a little bit here. Uh, brilliant, solid, believing Jew, uh, great hero, brilliant military mind. First and second Maccabees, I know it's found in the Catholic Bible. It's not inspired scripture, but it's very good history, and you need to know it. Okay, are you with me? Uh, interesting enough, Jerome, who put together the Latin Vulgate, the Catholic Bible, uh, that's still used today, Jerome said, this is, not prof this is not scripture, but it's so important, I'm gonna stick it in here. It's kind of forgotten today. And it is very important, I'm glad he did it, actually, just don't look at it as inspired scripture. Are you with me? Okay. Now, for Goldstein, in interpreting what's taking place here with Antiochus Epiphanes, this violent persecutor of uh, Judaism, the guy who tried to stamp it out, the key chapters are 11, 8, 9, I'm sorry, 7, 8, 9, and 11. And uh, 10 is an introduction to chapter 11. So we're going to take a quick look at what he had to say about these things. And if I lose you, uh, kind of raise your hand and give me an ugly look or something, and I'll try to back up and explain it. Okay? Now, what he taught was that uh, he recognized that Daniel had a prophecy about various kingdoms to rule. And what he ta taught was, Goldstein taught was, that Daniel thought there were four kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks, no Romans because he wants to apply Daniel chapter seven, the fourth kingdom, which I look on, and as a matter of fact, so does Jesus, if you know what you're looking at in the New Testament, as a prophecy related to the Antichrist. Are you with me there? He has to apply that to Antiochus Epiphanes because there are only four kingdoms, there's no Romans here. By the way, he recognized that later on in uh, chapter 11, there's a reference to the Katim, and it has to be the Romans. He knew that, he knew that. So he knew that uh, the Romans are on the scene, but anyway, uh, I'll jump over that. Let's move on down. What he argued was that Daniel did not know the Medes and the Persians were one empire. Now that's a rather stupid argument, to be very blunt, because you'll find in the book of Daniel that it talks about the Medes and the Persians, right? The law of the Medes and the Persians. So Daniel recognized that there was a unified empire, the Medes and the Persians. It's like the Anglo-Saxons. They're a unified group, okay? But he's arguing that Daniel, he has to have four kingdoms and he doesn't want one of them to be Rome. So he said Daniel made an error and thought the Medes had their own separate kingdom. Not true. And I don't think you can argue that. 
Now he will also argue that the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, 7 through 28, was Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes and not the Antichrist. Okay, I hope you're familiar enough with the book of Daniel to realize what I'm telling you here, okay? He has to make that Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, I, I think the book of Daniel is designed to give us an idea of what the Antichrist will be like based upon what Antiochus IV was like. Are you with me? Because there are a lot of similarities. Both will claim deity. Both will pollute the Jewish temple. And I think that's why you have in the book of Daniel that these two are set beside one another because it gives an appreciation of what the Antichrist will be like when we see what Antiochus Epiphanes was like. Are you with me now? Okay. Now, uh, as I told you before, the war scroll, by the way, the war in the war scroll, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know what war they're talking about? Armageddon. Talking about the Battle of Armageddon. That's exactly what they're talking about. Be surprised how much eschatology in the Dead Sea Scrolls matches very, very closely, uh, for example, with the Apocalypse of John, the book of Revelation. Now, again, Goldstein's world empires in the book of Daniel, he thought was the Babylonians, Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, and then the Greeks. And Antiochus Epiphanes was a little horn and persecutor and so forth. Now, let me show you very quickly. I'm going to take a look at just a few things in chapter 7, 8, 9, and 11, the way Goldstein taught. He said, uh, this is actually uh, uh, out of Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 through 8. Am I going too fast? No. Sometimes I get to talking too fast. The fourth beast was different from all the beasts that were before it. And I say this, see this is Rome. By the way, Hippolytus says it's Rome. And he says, and Rome was unified in his day. He says Rome's going to split eventually into ten parts. And he was basing it right on this passage of scripture. And while I was considering the ten horns, there appeared another horn, a little one growing up among them by which three of the first horns were uprooted. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth giving arrogant speeches going to be like an Adolf Hitler. He's going to be a great speaker. This is talking about the Antichrist. There's nothing here that matches Antiochus Epiphanes. He doesn't come on the scene when there are ten other kings. He doesn't push out three other kings. There are four main kings on the scene. Are you with me here? So it's very difficult to maneuver this around like Goldstein did and make this apply to Antiochus Epiphanes. Now let's take a quick look at Daniel chapter 8. I've got to watch my time here. Daniel chapter 8 and uh, this is, by the way, this entire chapter is actually directed toward Antiochus Epiphanes and his abomination of desolation. By the way, he ruled from 175 to 164 BC. Uh, he killed off his little nephew who had the better right to the throne than he did and married uh, the boy's wife, or married the boy's uh, mother, by the way, made her his wife. Now, here's what he does with it. He says that this, and he's absolutely right, Center, the center, central figure in Daniel chapter 8 is Antiochus Epiphanes. And for him, this is a key chapter. Now, he has two things that he deals with very quickly. The meteorite theory of the abomination of desolation. I'm going to come back to that. I want to deal with uh, chapter 9 and chapter 11, but I'm going to come back to that, uh, that theory of his of what the, the abomination of desolation of Antiochus Epiphanes was. He has a meteorite theory. So we get a little science in here. We have meteors at least, right? And then he's going to have a weird way of dealing with a passage there in Daniel that talks about 23 evenings and mornings. Now let me, uh, he said that equaled 1,100 days. Now let me show you that passage of Scripture. This is uh, Daniel chapter 8, the latter part of verse 13. And the question is asked, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? This is the vision of the persecution under Antiochus Epiphanes. Don't be deceived in thinking this somehow applies to the Antichrist. Okay, this is Antiochus Epiphanes. So how long is it going to last? The vision about the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that desolates the temple, and the trampling of the host. And he said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the temple will be reconsecrated. Now what Goldstein argues is that, you, that uh, Daniel here is counting evening and morning as each uh, a one. Are you with me? Okay, realize of course in the book of Revelation it was the evening and the morning of the first day. Same phrase by the way, and it means one day, right? But that's not what Goldstein argues. What he argues, he has to try to match it to Daniel chapter 9 where there's three and a half years. Are you with me? Okay, he has to try to get that close because he wants him, all of this to apply to Antiochus Epiphanes. 
both Daniel chapter 9 and also this passage. Well, this does apply to Antiochus Epiphanes. Actually, it, it equals about six years and six lunar months, which is a perfect match for the experience the Jews had under this great persecutor. Started out killing, uh, he didn't do it, one of his officials did, killed the high priest Onias III. And that began a whole series of events that's going to lead to thousands of Jews being killed by this uh, monster. Okay, now here's what he argues about those, uh, uh, those uh, 2,300 days. He says, three lunar years plus three lunar months would have elapsed equal to the 2,300 mornings and evenings of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. What's he doing here? You have to count the evening. He's saying 2,300 counts one for the evening and one for the, for the uh, morning. So you have to divide that by two. That comes up to 1,150 days. And... Uh, uh, three years and three months, 1150 days. And he thought that was about the same as three and a half years of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. So he gets them to equal. But you can see this is doing a lot of uh, um, very shifty dealing with the text. Are you with me? Okay. Besides that, you know, it's very clear in the book of Genesis that evening and morning means one day. Okay? And 2300 days matches very well with what we know historically about what Antiochus Epiphanes did. The last part of it was the worst, yes, but he was already taxing them and, and persecuting them and so forth. Now, Daniel chapter 9 is the 70 weeks vision. Goldstein realized this was to last for 490 years. Now, if you start going through that passage of Scripture, you see very quickly that there is a Messiah that gets killed. I hope you've been through Daniel 9 and looked at it very carefully. Okay, There's a Messiah that gets killed and has nothing. Remember that passage there? Of course, Goldstein can't have that being prophetically dealing with the Antichrist. He has to make it work for, for Antiochus Epiphanes. And what he argues was that the murdered Messiah there was the high priest Onias III who was killed in 170 BC. Now remember, he believed this prophecy ran for 490 years. And after the 69th week, after the 483 years, that uh, the Messiah, who's going to realize priests were anointed, so you could kind of use that for a priest, that the high priest is going to be killed. And so he's wrapping all of that prophecy around the murder of the high priest in 170 B.C. The problem is that if you take that, you take the 70 weeks must have started then in 653 B.C. Are you with me? 70 B.C. plus 483 B.C. is going to lead to 653 B.C. Are you with me? Okay. Now the problem with that is Jerusalem wasn't destroyed until 586. So he has to have a decree to restore the temple and the city being issued before the temple and the city had been destroyed. You see? And of course his explanation of that was that the Seer Daniel messed up the chronology. I don't think it was the Seer Daniel that messed up the chronology. I think it was the Seer Goldstein that messed up the chronology. <laughs> Fortunately he's dead. He would, he would probably be turning over in his grave now. But anyway... And then Daniel chapter 11, and I want you to see this is a game very frequently played by critical scholars. Uh, I call it the, you know, the clip and paste method of textual interpretation. If you don't like what it says, you clip this out and you move it here and move it there and you make it say what you want it to say. This is not a valid hermeneutical approach. And uh, the only thing that's ever really used for, to be honest, is the Bible to make it say what they want it to say. Now notice this, he's dealing with Daniel chapter 11 and uh, re realize that the first part of that, verse 30, is really dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. Verse 36 starts dealing with the Antichrist. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. But anyway, he writes this, if the verses alluded as they should have to events in chronological order, we would have them in the order of 30, 39, 36 to 38, 31 to 35. To make them say what he wants them to say, he clips that out, moves it here, moves it there. And uh, that's not a valid approach ever. Okay? Ever. But it ha happens all the time with critical scholars. Now this is, I'm going to go through these verses very quickly. This is uh, mainly my translation, uh, relying a little bit on the international translation and maybe the, 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 the uh, New King James, whatever. But I actually do look at the Hebrew here. His Antiochus IV armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation, which I believe was an idol in the temple. That's not what Goldstein believed. Here's verse 32. With flattery, he, Antiochus IV, will corrupt those Antiochian Jews who have violated the covenant. I'll tell you what Antiochian Jews are in a minute. 
But the people who know their God, pious Jews who follow the Maccabees, will firmly, firmly resist him. Then 33 to 34, those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned, talking about the persecution here, or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help. And that's the Maccabees. Goldstein said it, and he's absolutely right. And many who are not sincere, former Antiochian compromising Jews, who switched to the good side now, will join them. And that proved to be disastrous in the end. Now, some of the wise will stumble. This is a breaking point, by the way. Realize that the chapter divisions in Scripture are not inspired. You know that, right? They are not inspired. And I would make a chapter division here big time uh, after verse 35. But anyway, some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, which will come at, it, at its predetermined time. This is talking about the end of time, in effect, okay? It's not just talking about the end of, of uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, for me, and as I said, in the Dead Sea Scrolls and also in Hippolytus, there is a major break between 35 and 36, okay? And as I told you before, this is what Goldstein taught, that uh, this is, uh, um, this is uh, a, a, a continuation of the prophecy dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. Remember, they said Daniel wrote this history is prophecy from down to verse 35. Then Daniel began to give a false prophecy because verse 36 doesn't match Antiochus Epiphanes at all, and I'll show you that. Therefore, the book of Daniel was written in 165 B.C., just before the death of Antiochus IV Epiphanes in 164 B.C. And uh, before uh, uh, Antiochus IV died, fulfilling scripture, by the way, in his death and so forth, uh, according to Goldstein, uh, Dr. Goldstein, uh, Daniel uh, the seer died just before the death of Antiochus Epiphanes. Now the problem is, for these critics, is that Daniel already, already accurately predicted the death of Antiochus Epiphanes in Daniel 8.25b. Very quickly, I'll show you that. I gotta get moving, I'll never get through this. Here's what it says. He, Antiochus Epiphanes, will magnify himself in his own heart and will destroy many that are peaceful and prospering. He will also stand against the prince of princes. However, he will be crushed, but not by human power. So you see, Daniel predicted his end. Okay? So the idea that he's making a prophecy before Antiochus died is rather dumb, to be blunt. Now, this is Daniel 11, 36 to 37, and this does not match Antiochus Epiphanes, and it's talking about the Antichrist, and we've got to move through it quickly. The king who will do as he pleases. This is a title. The only other person for whom this title is used that I can think of in the New Testament, or in the Old Testament, is Alexander the Great. So this is a guy who does anything he wants to do. He will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and he will speak new and unique things against the god of gods. He will succeed until the time of wrath is completed, because that which has been determined must be done. He will not regard the god of his fathers. That does not match Antiochus Epiphanes at all, as I will show you. He will not regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor will he regard any god, because he will exalt himself above them all. Now that does not match Antiochus Epiphanes. Notice this, he will honor himself as a god of a fortified place or fortresses. He will honor a god unknown to his fathers with gold, silver, gems, and expensive gifts. Now, we've show, I've shown you this before, but realize this is what the abomination of desolation of Antiochus IV was. Idols in the temple, sacred prostitution, sacrificing pigs on the altar, killing mothers and babies that uh, have been set, uh, circumcised, and killing anyone who has a copy of the scriptures. Now, and here we're going to look at do what Dr. Goldstein believed about the abomination of desolation of Antiochus Epiphanes. I've got to leave the Antichrist behind. We're just going to look at Antiochus Epiphanes now and show you that the latter part of Daniel chapter 11 does not match him. Okay, are you with me? Am I losing you in all this? Okay, fashion your seatbelts. But anyway, now, based upon Daniel chapter 8, verse 10, Goldstein taught the following. It, the little horn, and this is a little horn mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the, of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled on them. This is what Daniel chapter 8 says. By the way, by the way realize the host of heaven is an imagery that's used of the Jewish people. Remember when Joseph has his dream? His brothers appear as stars and his mother as the moon and his father as the sun, right? 
So this is an imagery telling you that the Jews are going to be trampled on and they're going to be persecuted. That's what it's telling you. That's not the way Goldstein will interpret it. Moreover, he, Antiochus IV, will presume to lord it over the stars, the host of heaven. He shall notice the host of heaven has become for certain stars and not an imagery referring to the Jews. See what I'm telling you here? Okay. He shall presume to give prescriptions about the cults of the celestial deities. Worst yet, he will claim to have in his control fallen stars, meteorites. Okay. Now, here's what he says about the abomination of desolation of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. The abomination of desolation, a framework of three meteorites representing three gods of the imposed cult, is placed upon the sacrificial altar in, on one stand. Now, the problem with that is the meteorites tend not to be very big. But anyway, he's going to explain this. I'll show you here in a minute. At least three gods, Zeus, Athena, uh, he always spelled it with an E and rather than an A, and Dionysus are mentioned in the sources. There is good reason to believe that these are all of the gods of the imposed cult. No, there's not good reasons. He's imposing regular old Greek religion. Here's the god Zeus. Notice in his right hand, you have Nike, Nike. And this is where uh, Nike is sporting goods uh, take their name. It, it's the word for victory. She's the goddess of victory. Generally, there are only two deities that ever hold in their right hand the goddess victory. One is Athena, and the other is Zeus, or Jupiter. Here's Athena. Notice she's holding victory in her right hand. Looks like a little angel. And now the other shot. Here's the god Dionysus. Dionysus is the god of wine and parties. Drunken parties out in the woods. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are a number of words that you know of that come from the worship of Dionysus. One of them is orgia, from which we get the word orgy. orgy. Highly drunken sexual worship is what was involved. Here's another one of Dionysus, as you can see here. And uh, notice he's pouring wine out of that jar. And uh, then here's uh, him on his ship. And notice the dolphin was... Uh, was when his sacred animal noticed the, the grapes growing out of the mast of his ship there. Now, here's what Goldstein taught. The cult imposed upon the Jews by Antio Antiochus IV in 167 BCE involved the worship of multiple deities represented by meteorite stone, Masse both, standing stones, like you have mentioned in the Old Testament. Now, the standing stones in the Old Testament are generally pretty good size. We still have examples of them, okay? So he's saying that these meteorites are masse both, and the sacrifice of pigs and the eating of porks. Now, let's take some quick look at meteorites. It's pretty hard to find. You guys are scientists, scientific types. Have any of you ever found a big meteorite? Have any of you found a meteorite? Okay, very big. Now, notice this is being held in a hand. So he's got three meteorites, and where he got big ones at, I don't know, because they're rather, very quite rare. This one's on a Petri dish, you'll see. Okay. So he says this, thus the cult imposed by Antiochus Epiphanes as the true Judaism most probably did not involve the use of idols human or in human or animal form. He said it was just these meteorites. There were no images in the temple. This is contrary to what Josephus says. It's contrary to what 1 Maccabees says, what 2 Maccabees says, and I think even contrary to what Daniel is predicting here. Okay. He also says that it was not Greek religion. And this is... Uh, I need to be careful. Uh, this is not very smart, okay? I'll put it that way. It's just downright stupid, let's get honest. Okay. Now, one of the things, uh, what's, where's Antiochus Epiphanes coming from? Antiochus Epiphanes, as I told you, his father was defeated at the Battle of Magnesia in 190 BC by Scipio Asiaticus. Hannibal the Great was at that battle, by the way. And Antiochus III didn't think he had to listen to him. He was smarter than, than uh, Hannibal the Great. But anyway, and he's defeated. And Antiochus IV was sent as a hostage to Rome. He's going to live there for about 10 years, 8 or 10 years. Meanwhile, his brother Seleucus IV was the king, was going to be assassinated. He's mentioned, not by name, but he's mentioned in Daniel chapter 11. Seleucus IV is. He's the tax collector, if you read that carefully. The Adelaide king, Eumenes II, uh, will give uh, an army to Antiochus IV. He goes up, attacks Antioch, captures the guy who had assassinated his brother, and uh, he will pretend for a while to rule for his brother's son, his nephew, but the nephew ends up 
dead, as I told you, and Antiochus actually married the boy's mother and had children by her. Now, since he had been in Rome, he's trying to figure out why the Romans are so tough and so strong, he decides he's going to copy the Romans. Now, this is before the Roman Empire that began in 31 BC. This is the 160, well, 170s BC. So he decides he's going to copy the Romans. So he set up what was called the Antiochene Republic, copying Rome. He's going to convert the Jews into Greeks. That's what he's up to. Okay? Now, one of the problems he has is, this is uh, 1 Maccabees uh, 1, 14 to 15. They built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the custom of the Gentiles. By the way, you know how the word gymnasium translates? The place of nakedness. Okay? The place of nakedness. They built a gymnasium in Jerusalem according to the custom of the Gentiles and underwent operations to disguise their circumcision because they're having to exercise naked. That's what it's telling you. That's the way they did it in the gymnasium. I apologize, but you, you have to realize what's going on here. Rebelling against the sacred covenant, they joined themselves to Gentile and became the willing slaves to evil doing. Now, a gymnasium consisted of a building, or buildings, and exercise fields. And uh, the buildings were used for education. Generally, it almost always, it, well, matter of fact, it was, it was uh, almost always in Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh, Hesiod, and things like that. So you're, you're learning basically Greek mythology. And also, this is, a, uh, this is a piece of artwork here, and it's showing you the inside of a gymnasium. And if you look very carefully in the middle, you'll see that the primary deity of the gymnasium was a fellow by the name of Hercules, who was almost always pictured as, uh, without his clothes on. I'll show you some pictures of Hercules, so he's a little more covered. Here's uh, Hercules uh, with the three-headed dog of hell. Here's Hercules wearing the Nemean lion. That's very typical. He carries a club and wears that lion skin. Here's Hercules again with his club and the lion skin. Here he's killing a centaur. And I threw this in. I had to throw this in. I apologize for part of it here. But I wanted you to see he filled in for Atlas and holding up the world. Is it flat? <laughs> I run into people, they, oh, the ancient world, they thought the earth was flat. The Greeks and the Romans didn't know it was flat. Let me show you another one. Here's Hercules again holding up the world for Atlas. Doesn't look very flat to me. Okay, they knew the earth was round. They're not stupid. But anyway, now here's Hercules wearing uh, uh, his lion skin. And I want to show you some things leading up here. I've got to hurry up. Here, who's this? Alexander the Great. Now, and here's a statue of Alexander the Great. What's he have on his head? A lion skin. Who's he pretending to be? He's identifying himself with Hercules. This is kind of lost when people study Alexander the Great. Here's another statue of him. It's a lot easier to see. He's wearing a lion skin. Again, notice here's Hercules with his lion skin. Now let's look at some of the coins of Alexander the Great. Notice he has a lion skin hat. Here he is again. This, by the way, on the right side uh, is uh, Zeus holding an eagle in his hand. And you can see the name Alexander there on, uh, written in Greek beside him. Here's another one, Alexander. Notice he's again Hercules, Zeus holding uh, an eagle in his hand. Here's another one. I like this one of Zeus because you see the, the two-bladed axe there. Um, Zeus was supposed to be from the island of Crete. And uh, that's a symbol on the island of Crete. Uh, okay, notice again we're in a lion's thing. Here's another one. I'm going to go through these in a hurry here, show you some of this. This is an interesting one. There's a little bit of a change in this coin. What's the change? A pig's head's been added. Does this indicate? We do know that in some places, generally the main animal sacrificed to Zeus was a bull, but we know in some places they sacrifice pigs. Here's another one. I wanted to put this one in because I wanted to show you this again, Alexander the Great wearing Hercules' helmet, his hat. Notice the, uh, the planet Jupiter under the seat of uh, Zeus. Now, this one is particularly interesting to me. Alexander the Great, after he defeated Darius III at the Battle of Issus, will go down and capture Egypt. In Egypt, he's recognized by the Egyptians. The Egyptians hated the Persians. He's recognized as Pharaoh. And uh, the Pharaoh in Egypt was generally identified with Amun Re. The sacred animal for Amun was the ram. Notice here now, 
He's got a ram, and he's going to change his coins. Hmm, he just grew horns. He's noticed, I want you, what I want you to see is Alexander is claiming deity. We know he had, he, that he did it, but we really didn't recognize, you know, what deities he was, uh, so we started looking at coins, what deity he's identifying with. He starts out with Hercules, and he moves up to Zeus. Here's some more coins. Notice the ram's horn, ram's horn, ram's horn, ram's horn. <coughs> One of the generals of Alexander the Great was named Lysimachus, who for a while controlled some territory. He actually worshipped Alexander the Great. This is one of his coins, and notice he has Alexander the Great with the ram's horn of Ammon. And notice on the right-hand side, by the way, you see the goddess Athena, and holding in her hand is the god, the goddess Nike, Nike. Here's another one. This is a gold coin, coin of Lysimachus. That's his name that you can see over here. That's Lysimachus there in Greek. And actually, uh, in modern Greece, about 50 years ago, they made a, a dedicated a coin to Alexander the Great, and notice they put the ram's horn on the coin. See it? And you can read there in modern Greek, it's uh, the great Alexander, king of Macedonia. Now, let's go on here. Now, Alexander, of course, goes and he campaigns in India where he runs into elephants. Elephants are much bigger and tougher than lions. Okay, are you with me? He's killed elephants now. He's not going to go with this little lion stuff that Hercules did. So he starts showing up with a helmet that has an elephant on it. See the, see the tusks and see the, uh, the trunk? And notice Athena here is fighting. She's got her shield up. She's got her spear up uh, and so forth. There's a difference. Athena, when she has her helmet pushed over, that means peace. And her shield is down. Here again, notice he has an elephant uh, helmet, another elephant helmet. Another one of these with, uh, with Athena with her uh, spear ready to, or javelin ready to throw. And again with the elephant. Another elephant. And then I wanted you to see something. After the battle is over, uh, one of the things you have with Athena, she usually has her shield down, oftentimes having Nike or victory in her hand or right hand. And then she would push her helmet back on her head. I want you to see that Alexander here is going to identify with Athena. Where does that may seem? Realize she is the goddess of strategy and war and brilliance. Only two people gave you a victory. Mars, by the way, the god of war, was never ever uh, associated with Nike. Okay, it's either Athena or Zeus. And here she has her helmet pushed back. Notice this uh, coin of Alexander the Great. He has his helmet pushed back. And he looks a lot like Athena. Are you with me? He's claiming deity. Notice on the other side you have the, the goddess Nike again, the goddess of victory. Here's another one of his coins with the helmet pushed back. Okay, remember I told you that only two gods are ever pictured holding Nike, Athena and Zeus. Hmm, who's this? Alexander the Great. He's holding Nike. Again, here's Athena. Some pictures of Athena. I'll show you what she looked like. And again, notice here that Alexander the Great is looking very much like Athena, the goddess of, of uh, strategy and military uh, conquest and so forth. So I'm going to go through these in a hurry. These are various statues of Athena. And here you see her with her helmet pushed back. That means it's peace. And here you again notice Nike on her right, on her right hand. This is thought, this next one is thought to be a copy of the actual statue of Athena in the Parthenon. Okay? A reconstruction of the statue in the Parthenon. By the way, notice what's in her shield. It's interesting, isn't it? A snake. And he's telling you. He's telling you where that religion comes from. But anyway, uh, now the problem: the gymnasium. As I said, uh, they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem here, and they are trying to hide their circumcision because they're exercising in the nude. Goldstein says they never exercised in the nude. That was only when they went away. They had to traveling. The gymnasiums traveled for competitions, just like schools today do. And he said that they didn't exercise in Jerusalem in the nude, and they didn't have any statues. And yet every Greek gymnasium ever, they always exercised in the nude, and they always had statues of gods in them. So this is nonsense. Okay, I'm going to jump over these in a hurry here. Notice this is 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 4. The Gentiles filled the temple. This is the abomination of desolation of Antiochus Epiphanes. Filled the temple with debauchery and revelry as they lolled with prostitutes and had intercourse with women in the sacred courts and also brought in forbidden, forbidden things inside. 
I gotta hurry along here, okay? We talked about that, I'm gonna go, I'll show you a couple of, this is actually a temple of Zeus in uh, Pompeii. Notice the altar out in, fur, in front, it's like a barbecue pit, by the way. You notice here, they're roasting meat over an altar. The animal would be killed by the altar and then they would roast the meat and eat it. Here's another altar, another altar. Here's a picture of them killing a bull and they're going to take and roast parts of it on the altar. And to show you that they'd sacrifice pigs, notice that they're sacrificing a pig here. And here's an altar that actually has a pig on it. Notice the burn marks on the top where they would actually uh, cook parts of the pork. Here's another sacrifice scene. Notice that there are statues set up by the uh, altar that's going to be used to cook the meat. And one of the things that we find out too is, as I pointed out to you earlier, the Jews were forced to participate in the worship of Dionysus. And it was a very nasty religion of uh, drunkenness and orgy. And uh, the Jews were forced to participate. If you don't participate, you end up dead. And there's Dionysus again. And here, this is 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 2, to show you what the temple was like, what's going to happen in the temple. Not long afterwards, or thereafter, the king Antiochus Epiphanes sent Geron, this is one of his officials, the Athenian, to compel the Jews to depart from their ancestral laws and to cease living by the laws of God. He was also to defile both the temple in Jerusalem and the temple on Mount Gerizim. The Samaritan temple was still standing then. And so both of them are going to be converted into a worship place for who? Okay, the temple of Zeus, the temple in Jerusalem was going to be the temple of Zeus Olympius, and the temple of the Samaritans was going to be called the temple of Zeus Enios, uh, Zeus the foreigner, the foreign uh, Zeus, meaning basically it's the Greek Zeus. This is Mount Olympus, this is what's left of uh, the temple of Zeus on Mount Olympus, this is a reconstruction of it. This is what the statue is thought to have looked like, there are small copies of it. It still exists, a huge statue. And the interesting thing is this, in 2 Maccabees 6, 7, it says this, on the monthly birthday of the king, Jews were cruelly compelled to partake of the meat of pagan sacrifices. That means that Antiochus Epiphanes is claiming to be a god and he's being worshiped. Animals are being sacrificed and people are being forced to eat the meat of that sacrifice to him. Are you with me? They're doing it every month on his birthday. Realize it means that, you know, like mine is September the 3rd, it means October 3rd, November the 3rd, whatever. Okay? And notice this too. This is undoubtedly tied. A decree was published in the neighboring Greek cities on the proposal of the Antiochian citizens of Ptolemaeus that they partake of the meat of pagan sacrifices and that they butcher those Jews who refuse to go over to the Greek way of life. Okay? So you either participate in that meat sacrifice to Antiochus Epiphanes, or you're gonna die. Now this is his father, Antiochus III. Notice he has an elephant. I wanna show you a few of his coins. Here is Antiochus III with the god Apollo. This is Apollo. And when Antiochus IV became the king, he followed that imagery. You can actually see, it says over there uh, on that right-hand side, it says King Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, and that's the god Apollo. So he's not rejecting the gods of his fathers. I want you to see that, right? So that latter part of Daniel chapter 11 does not match. Now this is actually Ptolemy II wearing a sun crown. Remember, amun Ray was a sun deity too. And uh, one of the things you find with, Ant this is actually Antiochus Epiphanes. Notice he has a sun crown for a while. Another one of his coins with a sun crown. And then you have, here's Antiochus Epiphanes again. And you see Zeus, and notice Zeus is holding the planet Jupiter in his right hand. Here's Antiochus Epiphanes again. In this case, here's Athena. Notice he is not rejecting the gods of his fathers, right? You see that? Okay. And after he defeated the Egyptians, the Ptolemies of Egypt, uh, notice uh, he's in his four, full war regalia here. Notice the horns on his helmet. The Vikings didn't have horns, but he did. Okay. And uh, notice the other side of this coin, you see Nike is crowning him. The goddess Nike is crowning him. And this one is very interesting to me because what you see is over on the right-hand side there, you see that's his picture on the left, on my left anyway. I hope that's your left, yeah. Uh, and uh, you see the god Zeus. And notice it says uh, uh, King Antiochus, that's on the far right. And then over on the left you see Theu, that's the word God from which we get the word theology, Epiphanes. 
King Antiochus, God manifest. Now underneath, underneath there at the bottom, you can see right here, is the word Nike Foru. That phrase, that word, is only used for two deities, Zeus and Athena. It means bringer of victory. Remember, they're the only ones who have it in their hand. So this is a very unusual phrase for a human to use, okay? Especially for Greeks. Notice here is Zeus again with the eagle. Notice Nike is on his right hand. Here's Athena with Nike on her right hand. And here's another coin. This is a little bit later on. Notice that Nike is crowning the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. See that? Okay. And notice again, it's calling him bringer of victory. And then we start to get coins, and this is about the time the persecution really takes off, in which he begins to change. Notice he's growing a beard. Notice again, you've got King Antiochus, Theos Epiphanes, and underneath, I know this coin's in bad shape, but it says, bringer of victory. Now this one's even more interesting, I think. Here you've got, notice now, he looks exactly like Zeus. See that? He looks exactly like Zeus. And the lettering says, King Antiochus, God manifest. What God is he manifesting? I think he's claiming to be Zeus. Okay? And again, you say, Nike Foru. I think what he did was, I think he took a copy of the statue of Zeus in the temple at Olympus and put his head on it. Here's another one of it. Now we got to go very quickly. Give me, I'm going to steal about 10 minutes from the questions, okay? The Hanukkah Reformation of Judas Maccabeus. Judas Maccabeus was the son of a guy named Mattathias. By the way, if you start going through the names of the apostles, you're going to find out that about all of them are named after these early Hasmoneans. Matthew, John, uh, I mean, right down the line. These guys were great heroes. Judas. Judas Maccabeus was a great man of God. His father was a great man of God. Quoted the book of Daniel, by the way, we're told, in uh, 1 Maccabees. My prof did not know what to do with that because Daniel hadn't been written yet when that <laughs> supposedly taken place, see? But that's what it says. But anyway, and Judas is going to recapture the temple there, and he's going to cleanse the temple uh, in the latter part of 164 B.C. Now here's what 1 Maccabees says. He, Judas Maccabeus, appointed unblemished priests, lovers... By the way, this is Goldstein's translation, and it's incorrect. He, Judas Maccabeus, appointed unblemished priests, lovers of the Torah, who purified the sanctuary and removed the, removed the stones of the loathsome structure to an unclean place. The problem with that is that word sanctuary there is not singular, it's plural, both in the Greek text and in the, Roman, in the Latin text. The reason he's doing that is Goldstein does not want there to be an image inside of the temple itself. Are you with me? Only that three meteorite stones out on the altar. Okay, you understand what I'm arguing here? Remember he said there's no images in there at all. But yet this, the, the actual text is telling you that there is. By the way, uh, notice the Greek version is Hagia, uh, the holy places. The best translation of that from both the Greek and the Latin is the holy places. The word for structure does not appear at all in the Greek or Latin texts. Goldstein has supplied it to make it fit with his idea of these three meteorites on one structure. Are you with me? So he's added to the text. The adjective loathsome modifies stones and not the missing word structure. Okay, here's the best translation. This is my translation. He, Judas Maccabeus, selected priests who were ritually spotless and who willingly adhered to the law of God, and they cleansed the holy places, the interior of the temple, and carried the polluting stones. The old images and idols of the Greeks and Romans were almost always made out of marble or some precious stone. And undoubtedly, the, the uh, Jews broke them into pieces and carried them off. And they carried them away to a filthy place. That word filthy place means almost certainly a latrine. These are toilet holes. They probably threw the pieces into toilet holes. Are you with me? Now, you're, that's not something you want to advertise to the Greeks and the Romans. Okay? And then it talks about, what about the altar of sacrifice, where the pigs were sacrificed? They cleaned out the temple. Notice it was only pure priests who would go in the temple and clean it out. As far as the, the, um, the uh, altar of sacrifice, I mean, the, the Levites could do that. 
They deliberated over what they should do with the profaned altar of the burnt offering, and they came up with the good idea of dismantling it, lest the fact that the Gentiles had defiled it should be held to their disgrace. Accordingly, they dismantled the altar and put its stones away on the Temple Mount in a suitable place until a prophet should come to give an oracle concerning them. So they didn't know what to do with these uh, stones that had been polluted by pig blood, so they took them and put them uh, a different place. I've got an idea where that's at, but we're not going to deal with that. Here again is uh, the image of Zeus on Mount Olympus. And again, as I pointed out to you, notice that Antiochus Epiphanes starts looking exactly like Zeus, and I think identifying with Zeus. So the abomination of desolation of Antiochus Epiphanes, I believe, was an idol of Antiochus IV, Theos Epiphanes, that's his title, God manifest as the god Zeus Olympius. Now that's, you say, is that a stretch? I want to show you something, one more thing I'm going to close with. During the, uh, well, when Paul was still alive, there was a Caesar by the name of Gaius, or Caligula Caesar. He proclaimed that he was the god Jupiter, Zeus, that's the Roman version of Zeus. And he ordered that his gold gilted statue be placed in the Jewish temple in 41 BC. Fortunately, he's going to be assassinated before that was completed. He also renamed the Jewish temple the temple of the illustrious Gaius, the new Jupiter. Here's one of his coins, and it's very interesting. I hope you can hear me. You can see over here Caesar Augustus Germanicus Emperor, and over here the divine Augustus, father of the fatherland. Okay? And notice on this side, what kind of a crown does he have? He's got a sun crown. And then we're told, by the way, by Suetonius, the uh, biographer of the early Caesars, that one of the things he did was he issued an order that all of the statues of Zeus in his entire realm have the heads removed and his head be placed on those statues. Okay? Do we have any more archaeological? This coin alone is good proof, I think. Do we have any archaeological proof? Notice here is Gaius Caligula. Good buddy, by the way, of, uh, of Herod Agrippa uh, the first that you find in the uh, book of Acts. They're good buddies, educated together. Notice him. Things are missing here. What's missing out of his right hand? What's missing out of his left hand? Here's Zeus. Nike's missing and the staff's missing, but if you look back, he's portraying him. Notice how the robe is? He's portraying himself as Zeus. So we actually have archaeological proof that he did indeed claim to be Zeus. Now we've got to conclude with this. It's talking about what, uh, what uh, uh, Judas Maccabeus did. Maccabeus and his men, with the Lord leading them, recovered the sanctuary in the city. They destroyed the illicit altars which the foreigners had built around the marketplace and also the illicit shrines. It wasn't just in the temple, it was all over the place in Jerusalem. After purifying the temple, they made another altar using fire. They got the igniting stone for the fire. For the first time in three years, they offered sacrifices and incense and installed the lights and set out the showbread. Uh, you with another one here? I ask you a question. Why do not first and second Maccabees and Josephus give the names of the gods worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem? Answer, these writers knew that smashing the idols of Greek gods would present a major problem for the Jews who were ruled over first by the Greeks and over then by the Romans. So in other words, the reason why Josephus and even first and, Mac first and second Maccabees don't tell you, well, they smashed up an idol of the, of the god Zeus is, it's going to cause them all kinds of political problems. You understand what I'm arguing here? Because the, the, the names of the deities are not given. And that's one of the reasons why Goldstein was able to take latitude and, and argue that uh, you know, there weren't any images in the temple, and yet they were. Now, one final point. This, of course, the cleansing of the temple is where Hanukkah first takes place, first celebration of Hanukkah. Now, I have a question for you. Did Jesus ever celebrate Hanukkah? How many say yes? How many say no? How many don't know? <laughs> okay. As a matter of fact, he did, and I want you to know that. Jesus was a Jew and he celebrated Hanukkah. And that's found in John 10, 22 to 23. He went up to Jerusalem to the temple for the Feast of Dedication. That means the rededication. The word Hanukkah means dedication. So he's going and celebrating Hanukkah. Okay? Uh, by the way, let me issue a warning to you from the Lord. Do not become anti-Semitic. God does not like it. His son was a Jew. And he still has plans for the Jews, okay? 
that's my presentation. I hope you did enjoy it and learned something from it. And we're going to uh, first have uh, come up and have an offering. Thank you very much. Then if you have some questions in the time that's left, I'll try to answer them. I don't, do hope I didn't lose you in all of that because I was hurrying through and I, I did want to deal with that. As I told you, my professor was a brilliant researcher, prodigious researcher, and a brilliant linguist. But the fact of the matter is his historical analysis, especially dealing with the book of Daniel, was just faulty. Just faulty. Yes? How would you translate the abomination of desolation? Well, I think it's fairly explicit. It means that it's, it's something that's so horrible that it's going to take and uh, corrupt, totally corrupt the temple. And uh, the Jews will have to go through a regular ritual to cleanse and use it again after it's been polluted with pig blood and idols and so forth. And it, it, the interesting thing, of course, is, and I didn't really deal with it, if you start looking there, we're talking about uh, Daniel chapter 9, and uh, Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, Jesus is talking roughly in 30 AD. The abomination of desolation of Antiochus Epiphanes was in 167 BC. So he's not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. He's talking about the Antichrist. And it's going to be the same thing again. If you look, Paul actually tells us that one of the things the Antichrist will do and realize uh, this prediction indicates there's going to be a rebuilt Jewish temple. I know there's a Muslim mosque up there, okay? But it's very clear from Scripture that one of these days there's going to be a rebuilt Jewish temple and it's going to be polluted by the Antichrist, just like the temple of Antioch, uh, the temple uh, in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes was polluted by him. Does that help? Yes? The fact that they, the Jewish people didn't know what to do with the stones that had been polluted and pushed them away. Yes. So a suitable prophet would come. Yes. So that's one of the indications that the book of Mac the books of Maccabees aren't inspired scripture. They were looking for a prophet to come. Yeah, they were like Judas the Maccabee was a great man of God. And actually if he would have been during the time of the judges, he would have been there. I look on him a lot like the uh, prophet Gideon. You know, he was a great man of God, but his family after him went bad, and that happens to the Asmoneans. Uh, one of the things that will happen is that two has, later on, uh, one has been, actually kills off his mother and a couple of his brothers. Um, you know, in three generations, they're, they're turning rotten. And as a result of that, a fellow by the name of Antipater cozies up to the Romans who have now become the rulers. And you don't know Antipater, but who knows what his son's name was? Herod the Great. Herod the Great. And it's when this family begins to be corrupt that uh, Herod the Great is able to take over and become the king. He's made king by, by uh, Mark Antony and Caesar Augustus, made him the king when they were still friends. Yeah, another question? Yeah, actually, I, I hope I can ask two questions. One is, and I hope this isn't a tangent, but the Statue of Liberty wears a sun crown. Who is the Statue of Liberty? And the second question is, uh, Maccabees wasn't his original name, and it means something. What is it? The, the name Maccabees actually means? Maccabees it actually was used only for Judas, and it means the hammerer. This guy was the most brilliant uh, guerrilla fighter ever. I, I'm not exaggerating there. He was absolutely brilliant, and the Lord was with him. And he had four brothers, and they were just as tough as he was. One of his brothers, one of his brothers died fighting against elephants. He took the biggest elephant in the line of uh, Antiochus IV and went after it, fought his way underneath of it, had to fight through Greeks to get underneath it, took his sword and goes like this to the biggest elephant, killed it, but it fell on him and crushed it. <laughs> so it wasn't just Judas, all four of his brothers, and all of them died violently in one, in one, in one way or another. Uh, they all ended up being killed. Now, what was the first question? The Statue of Liberty wears oh. the sun. Well, that's, a, that's an, actually, it's an old symbol. And I strongly suspect uh, uh, one of the things that you had of the kings of France, and that was given to us by the French. Um, and one of the things you have by the old kings of France, now this is after the French Revolution. The kings of France oftentimes identified, identified themselves with Apollo, and Apollo was a sun deity. So maybe from that, I don't know. It's an old imagery, but it actually comes to us from France. Yes? Lives were lost during the time of 
Christ? No, we really don't. Uh, there are a couple of passages that refer to thousands being killed in Jerusalem, but we don't know how many were killed altogether. Uh, it's not nearly, excuse me, it's not nearly the number that are going to die when Titus took Jerusalem, and certainly it's not the number that died in the terrific Holocaust uh, a few years back. But uh, tens of thousands, also unquestionably tens of thousands, and realize their population is not that great. Percentage-wise, it probably is about the same as you had in the Holocaust. I'm talking percentage-wise, not numbers. Okay? Um, yeah, other questions? Yes? Uh, do you have a, a paper or a printed copy of in your lecture tonight? Yes, I'm actually going, I'm, I'm debating on where to, to publish it right now. It will eventually get published. By the way, let me do a little advertising for you, just a second. <laughs> Now, I, I write for this magazine, Artifacts. How many of you heard of Artifacts before? Okay, some of you get it, I'm sure. If you don't subscribe, you know, I'd encourage you to do that. You can actually look up under Bible Artifacts. It's uh, $20 a year, comes out four copies. We cover all the latest information uh, dealing with biblical archaeology. We go after biblical critics like Israel Finkelstein. You don't know who he is, but I do. And <laughs> some of you heard of him. And uh, we deal with uh, critics of the Bible. Uh, correcting things, give you the latest news. Uh, I'll give you one thing real fast. Uh, is it in this issue or the one before this? Uh, Israeli archaeologists were digging just to the west of the Temple Mount. They found something very unusual. They found, you know what a triclinium is? Triclinium, that's the old feast. That's what Jesus was in, was a triclinium at the Last Supper. And it's around three walls. You have a, like the four walls of a house. Three walls, it has like a benches there. And you actually laid down on your left side and you had a table out in front. Generally, for a triclinium, a good number was nine, three on each side. This one has a double triclinia, tri triclinia, not triclinium, and in the middle is a fountain, like this. It's a very ri rich, very wealthy one. Now, the archaeologists, the Jewish archaeologists who have found it say it was either used by a Jewish king or by the high priest. Now, there's no king uh, at the time. I'm going to talk about when it was destroyed. There's no king. There's only, at the time it was destroyed, there was only a Roman governor. So it can't be a king, although we do know that, that Herod Antipas did come to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover because he was there when Jesus was crucified. But this almost certainly was uh, these two facing uh, triclinium, triclinia, facing each other, almost certainly were used by the high priests. Now, here's what's interesting. This is not Christian archaeology, this is Jewish archaeologists. They said, hmm, very interesting. These things were destroyed by an earthquake in 30 AD. Find that interesting? That's the kind of stories we cover for you. So if you're interested, look under Bible Artifacts. We do have, you can, you can subscribe to in PayPal, but we cover all the latest news in archaeology. Now we're about to run out of time. Oh, I guess we've got about 11, 10 minutes. Yes. Well, I think it actually was kind of twofold on the part of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, first of all, the Greeks and Romans did sacrifice pigs. We know that. And uh, generally for Zeus, it was a bull, but we do know that there were temples where pigs were sacrificed to Zeus. So it was not uncommon for them to sacrifice pigs. But I think also Antiochus Epiphanes knew enough about Jewish religion that, uh, you know, you're not supposed to eat pork. Uh, and I think he probably did it for both reasons. I think both of those were in his mind. Now, the university that I went to, uh, State University, was, uh, now that's not where Goldstein was at, it was another university. Goldstein was the University of Iowa. But uh, at another university I was at, the half the population was Jewish, and I used to give them a bad time because the favorite uh, sandwich, uh, they had kind of a deli, uh, deli there, the favorite sandwich was ham and cheese on Jewish rye, and, you know. <laughs> you realize you can't have milk and meat together and it's pork to boot, you know. But um, they also, by the way, had fun because they, that was back when, when Volkswagen Beetles were very popular. You know who designed, helped design the Volkswagen Beetle? Who? Nope. 
Who said it? Hitler did. Hitler and Porsche got together. Porsche, the Porsche founder of the car, they got together and designed the, the Beetle. And they got all these Jewish kids running around in these Beetles designed by Adolf Hitler. It's called a Volkswagen. It means a people's car. Yes. Yeah, they're actually, uh, and I didn't take it from there because I'm trying to avoid uh, copyright. I may get in copyright trouble anyway. But uh, there is actually a whole set of books from the British Museum. You're going to have to get to a major library. They probably have them at the University of Minnesota. I know they had them at the University of Iowa. But there are, are books, and I mean like that many books of coins, and telling you what they are and what the uh, inscriptions mean. Yes? The Ark of Covenant, no, was not around during so this time. essentially, it was sort of protected from all the nasty stuff that was going on. Yeah, I've got a friend um, who made, helped make one of the great discoveries in biblical archaeology, by the way. He's a Christian friend. His name is Gordon France. And um, Gordon France has a hobby. He makes a list of all the places where the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be located. And the last time I knew, he had over two dozen places on his list. Um, what happens to the Ark of the Covenant disappears in the days of Jeremiah, and I will kind of leave it there. As for the golden menorah and other temple items that were carried off by Titus, I know a lot about those. They're still on the phone. I don't know where they are. Uh, i got a pretty good idea. Okay. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, back over here. Yeah. Yes. There, as far as I know, and this, I think what Goldstein said too, that uh, there were two meteorites. Now, he's not talking about um, the Kaaba, um, but there were two other places where they had meteorites that were in the temple and were actually uh, used in worship. Anything out of the heavens was looked on, of course, as being divine in some way or another. And, um, but generally, you know, uh, as you know well, meteorites are not very big. You need to find a big one is highly unusual. And I can't see having those little things as calling those standing stones. Um, it's hard, very hard to find three good sized meteorites in any kind of a short period of time. Yes, right back here. Yes. It's unquestionably the Antichrist and making the treaties, making, realize that one of the things that happened to me when I found out, when I took with, Dan, with uh, Dr. Goldstein, and he was supposed to do a translation of Daniel for the Anchor Bible, I got intensively involved in Daniel, and I took a course from him in Daniel. And uh, you can see already that I did not agree with his interpretations, and he knew that. When I took his course, I told him before I took the final exams, you know, this is, Probably not the smartest thing I ever did, but I said, you realize that I'm going to write this exam the way you taught the course, but this is not what I believe. And a couple of times I asked him questions that he had, that he struggled with, by the way. Uh, but no, it is definitely the Antichrist. And he makes a treaty that's to last seven years with the Jews. In the middle of it, he breaks it, and he's going to take over, rebuild. There's no question there's going to be a rebuild Jewish temple. Nice. If I said that, in, among the Palestinians, I'd probably get stoned. But uh, the Bible's very clear in the last days there'll be another Jewish temple, and that's going to be polluted by the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation period. Okay? Now, I'm giving you eschatology. This is not really, I'm better off doing history, but this is what I believe eschatology, too. Yeah, back over here. The uh, Antiochus Epiphanes would, would uh, crucify women with their babies hung around their neck. Yes. It, it, we're, I, I wouldn't say for certain he's going to crucify. As a matter of fact, if you look in, in the book of Revelation, it indicates that the way I call them tribulation Christians will be killed is to have their heads chopped off. Uh, whether he'll crucify people, I probably not. Um, it seems to like to chop off heads. But he is, if you, know, if you don't follow his religion, you're going to end up dead. Yes? Um, 
they know we are deserve women that is wrong. They chop up heads. The only one you know that did that today is the norm. It seems like all the descriptions are pointing to that, and I know that right now Islam is really. I can't remember the name of it, but it's like their. Sharia law, you mean? No, not that. It's a messiah. It's oh yes, it's yeah, it's yeah. yeah. They, they do believe in a version of a, of a coming messiah. So do the Jews. So the Jews. They're. Uh, I need to watch because this is going to be on tape, on uh, available on. But realize there is a lot of uh, of, uh, of Judaism that's been transformed by Islam. There's more than casual connections there. Muhammad at one point in time actually expected the Jews to join him. He was very upset when they didn't. First he was friendly toward him, and then when they wouldn't join him, he became very upset with them and forced them to leave. Uh, that area of Saudi Arabia that he was at. So there are more than casual connections uh, between them. I mean, realize if you're a Muslim, you're not allowed to eat pork. Um, the washings are very much like the mikvah that Jews had to use before they went into the temple and so forth. So there's a, there are more than casual connections there. Uh, Mohammed has picked up a lot from Judaism and claims to have. Uh, he claims that the Old Testament was polluted by the Jews and the Christians, uh, they believe in Christ, you of course knew that. They believe in Christ, they look on Christ as a Messiah, but not as God, not as deity, okay? The other questions you, you ask me, I'll a try to answer to you more privately, okay? Are there any other questions, or are we done? What time have we got left? Got two minutes left. Everybody satisfied? Yes? I'm not sure if you quite uh, clarified <coughs> as to why this uh, Professor Goldstein insists that it's three meteorites and not actual sacrifices, and why there must not have been statues or, or nudity. What, what, what is that? Why is that relevant? Well, because actually, I think the historical text and the historical information doesn't match his theory at all. Uh, I don't think it was just three meteorites on the altar. I think there was a statue in the interior of the temple. And uh, I think that basically is the old Christian Jewish tradition uh, is that inside of the temple was the pollution as well as outside. The whole temple was polluted. It wasn't just out on the altar. I, I understand that. I just don't understand why, why does his theory necessitate that there were meteorites? No. Why did he go to that meteorite theory? Why did, what rests on that? What hangs on that? Well, you know, I had a friend, and uh, you know, do, how many of you know Dr. Charles Ailing? Mm -hmm. no. If you ask him a question about something that uh, uh, someone had a really crazy theory, he would say, you'd say, where did they get that from? He said, you get it from first thumb succalonians. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure exactly why. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly why Goldstein went to that meteorite theory. Um, but he did. Now, one, one of the reasons that, was, that encouraged me to do this paper and put this presentation together was uh, there was a professor, I think he was from Princeton University, and he was speaking highly of Dr. Goldstein's work. I think, I, I can't allow this. You know, I've got to deal with this now. Even if he was my professor, he did a great deal for me. I need to recognize that. He did a great deal for me, helped to educate me and so forth. But his analysis, particularly dealing with scripture, is just faulty, just faulty. I can't really answer your question because I don't know. It's just, to me, it's so, I shouldn't say the word silly, but it's so crazy uh, to think that that's what's involved based upon, it was completely based on Daniel chapter 8, verse 10, completely based on it, his interpretation that the, the stars there are referring to real stars coming down to earth, and that must mean meteorites. And uh, uh, realizing, of course, that the Jews are referred to as stars, uh, as you can see there in the story with Joseph, and so forth, but that's not the way he interpreted it. Now, one more and we better quit. Uh, the pictures of the coins you had are just stunning. How did they make those coins? How did they coin them? They actually had experts who would, would carve those out. Um, a mold, you mean? Yeah, they make a mold and they would stamp them, pound them. Yeah, they strike them. What was the mold made out of? Uh, material. Yeah. It, are these silver? Some of them are silver, some of them are gold, a lot of them are silver, there's some bronze ones too. Um, 
but uh, they use, oh, there's a very hard stone, I can't think what it is that they oftentimes used. Uh, after a certain amount of time, of course, they get worn and you have, to, you have to replace them. That's why you have basically the same coin appears a little bit different each time. You notice that? It's because they do wear out. Yeah. Okay, I think we probably better stop there. I appreciate you all coming. Yeah.